At the tender age of 28, Brian Koberger became a central figure in a nightmarish crime that shattered the lives of four bright University of Idaho students. Now, as the courtroom transforms into an arena of hidden truths and twisted tales, the question looms large. Will justice triumph or will the shadows consume the truth forever? Join us as we unravel the shocking story of Brian Koberger, a journey that will leave you questioning the depths of human darkness and the pursuit of justice. In November, Brian Koberger was charged with four counts of first-degree murder for the stabbing deaths of four students in an off-campus house. After a six-week manhunt, he was arrested and chose to stand silent during his court appearance, refraining from entering a plea of guilty or not guilty. As a result, the judge recorded a not guilty plea on his behalf. This unusual choice adds another layer of intrigue to the ongoing legal proceedings. In a surprising development, prosecutors revealed their intention to pursue the death penalty in the case against Brian Koberger. They justified this decision based on the especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel nature of the crimes and Koberger's alleged utter disregard for human life. The decision to seek the death penalty adds a significant dimension to the proceedings and raises the stakes for all involved. The horrific incident shocked the entire nation when four young individuals, Kaylee Guncalvis, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernadel, and Ethan Chapin, aged 20 and 21, were attacked on November 13th, right before Thanksgiving. Notably, Ethan was not a resident at the house, but was staying there with his girlfriend, Kernodal. Fortunately, two other roommates, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk, who were present during the incident, were unharmed and were quickly ruled out as suspects by investigators. Initially, it was believed that Mortensen and Funk had slept through the attack. However, a recently released probable cause affidavit following Brian Koberger's return to Idaho revealed new information. One of the surviving roommates disclosed seeing a person dressed in black clothing and wearing a mask who walked past her as they left the scene of the crime. Additionally, she mentioned hearing crying in the night of the killings. The affidavit shed light on these chilling details, further intensifying the investigation. Gon Calvis' family expressed gratitude for the prosecution's pursuit of the death penalty while acknowledging the support they have received during this difficult time. Investigators discovered crucial evidence at the crime scene, including DNA on a leather knife sheath. Subsequent searches of Kohlberger's residence yielded a knife, Glock pistol, black gloves, a black hat, and a black face mask. Furthermore, they dismantled a white 2015 Hyundai Elantra a vehicle occasionally driven by the accused. Koberger's defense attorney criticized the prosecution's reliance on investigative genetic genealogy, referring to it as a bizarrely complex DNA tree experiment. This method, which uses DNA from crime scenes to identify suspects through genetic matches, has gained traction in solving cases in recent years. Prosecutors claim that the FBI employed this technique and obtained results from public DNA sites, which ultimately led them to focus their investigation on Koberger. Brian Koberger, who is currently studying for a PhD in criminology at Washington State University near the Idaho-Washington border, is set to go on trial on October 2nd. The BBC has contacted his defense attorney for their perspective on this ongoing and captivating case. In the most recent interview hosted by Jesse Weber, Professor Epstein, known for teaching death penalty law and handling capital cases, provided valuable insights into the decision and the legal complexities surrounding it. Throughout the episode, Weber and Professor Epstein engaged in a compelling discussion, exploring the factors presented by the prosecution to support their decision to pursue the death penalty. They investigated the heinous nature of the crimes, Koberger's alleged disregard for human life, and the potential impact on the outcome of the trial. One crucial point of discussion was the role of the victims' families and their varying opinions on the death penalty. While the desires of the families are significant, Professor Epstein emphasized that the prosecutor's ultimate decision is not solely determined by their preferences. Instead, the prosecutor considers a range of factors, including the facts of the case and legal considerations. 
Another compelling aspect was the evaluation of Koberger's alleged propensity to commit murder and the potential threat he may pose to society. Professor Epstein shed light on the complex nature of assessing an individual's propensity for future violence and how this factor could be argued by both the prosecution and defense during the trial. Koberger's defense team, led by Ms. Taylor, Mr. Lobster, and Ms. Nasid, is demanding critical evidence from the prosecution as they prepare to mount their defense. The defense's plea for access to crucial materials comes amidst ongoing motions discussions in the courtroom seeking to ensure a fair trial for their client. As the legal battle intensifies, the public eagerly awaits the judge's ruling on the defense's demands in the Idaho student murders case. At the start of the trial, the judge discussed a revised order that caused some confusion. The judge made it clear that the order applied to both prosecutors, defense attorneys, and law enforcement, since they were all considered representatives of their legal teams. To avoid any confusion, the judge announced plans to issue another revised order that would explicitly include law enforcement and defense investigators. The judge also discussed the presence of cameras in the courtroom, cautioning the media to strictly follow the rules and refrain from focusing on specific individuals or violating the boundaries set by the court. The judge referenced a previous case where cameras had to be removed due to their excessive focus on the defendant. The judge emphasized the importance of capturing the entirety of the proceedings rather than honing in on specific individuals. After these general announcements, the focus shifted to the specific motions on the agenda. Ms. Taylor, representing Mr. Koberger, requested that the court address their motion to control and hold certain options, excluding the third option, which would be discussed separately on a different date. Ms. Taylor then directed the court's attention to the remaining motions to compel discovery. She began by discussing the first motion to compel, specifically request number six, which pertained to training records of three police officers involved in critical interviews, decision-making, and evidence collection related to the case. Ms. Taylor argued that these records were necessary to understand the officers' processes and decisions. The state objected, stating that the training records were not included within Rule 16 and were not material to the case. The state argued against opening the door to requesting training records for numerous other investigative officers involved in the case. Ms. Taylor countered by highlighting the officer's relevance and the need to examine their training records for a comprehensive understanding of the investigation. Moving to the second motion to compel, Ms. Taylor discussed request number one, which sought information from the FBI task team, specifically related to Mr. Koberger's cell phone records. The state acknowledged that they had the requested information, but did not provide a specific date for its delivery. Ms. Taylor requested a court order with a deadline to ensure timely receipt of the information. Ms. Taylor also addressed request number four from the same motion, which concerned an outstanding report from an FBI forensic examiner regarding the identification of a white Hyundai Elantra. Again, the state acknowledged the importance of the report and offered to provide it when available, but Ms. Taylor requested a court order with a specific deadline. The state responded by asserting that the training records requested were not material to the case and that they had substantially complied with other discovery requests. They assured the court that they would provide the requested information as soon as possible. Upon hearing both sides, the judge stated that they would take the matter under advisement and examine the relevant rules and case law before issuing a written decision. The proceedings concluded and the parties were adjourned. Overall, the motion's discussion revolved around the defense's request for specific discovery items, highlighting the importance of these materials for Mr. Koberger's defense and the state's commitment to providing them. The judge remained impartial, intending to review the arguments and legal principles before making a decision on the outstanding requests. As the legal battle intensifies in the Brian Koberger case, the quest for justice and truth continues. Will the defense team succeed in obtaining the crucial evidence they demand? What do you think? Let us know in the comments section below. To stay updated on this gripping case and other legal matters, subscribe to our channel and never miss a moment of the unfolding courtroom drama.